Sometimes, if you look carefully, you'll see almost a separation of the yeah. two liquids. So they sometimes call it waking the serpent. So I know it's very poetic. Excuse me. I get to go to some of the coolest bars in the world, meet the best bartenders, and experience different drinks in different cities. And it's, it's ridiculous. I want to show you my city, some good places, some good bars. No I'm here to get your best. Can you give me your best drink? Cocktail no bar. culture is giving someone experience. It's not just a nice drink. And I want to put the magic ingredient inside. Wow. I don't know how to describe it. It's really nice. <laughs>started to be back in London. I'm going to see Tristan Stevenson. He was an old friend of mine from when I lived here. Yeah, it's the first time that I'm spending the week with someone that I've met, so that'll be a nice change. He won the 2012 Bartender of the Year in UK, and he's also gone on to write a book called The Curious Bartender. And coming into London, I mean, there's a bit of expectation. It is the melting pot of everything. Culture, art, music. And it's got three of the five best bars in the world. And I think we're here, actually. Where's Dan? Hey, Kerry. How are you, brother? Good to see you, man. You too. Welcome back to London. Oh, it's good to be back. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Years. You're looking well. Yeah, you look good too. Welcome brother. back to London. It's good to be back. Yeah. I haven't been back since I lived here, and it was just a constant winter. Yeah, well, the weather's been on our side today. It's... <laughs> let's have a walk. Let's All catch right, up. Let's go. So tell me, what's been happening? Do you know what? In the last five years, I've opened three bars in London, written a lot of books. Yeah. Um, so it's been busy. So these three bars, they all quite different? Yeah, I mean, it's different concepts um, entirely, and that sort of... I think typifies what London's all about in the bar scene, really, is that, that there's so much experimentation and innovation going on. Um, I mean, the city is a melting pot of people, yeah. and it's a melting pot of cocktail culture as well. There's bars that are bringing in um, spirits and, and ideas from all over the world, and mm -hmm. you kind of get it all here. This has got a lot of history around here. Yeah, I mean, this whole area, the St Giles district, just at the bottom of Covent Garden, this was the, the kind of grand zero for all the illicit gin shops um, during the gin craze back in the 1700s. Why gin? Was it cheap to make? Was it easy to make? What was the...? Both of those things, exactly. During the Victorian times, a lot of the bigger distilleries started putting money into um, premises for people to go and drink gin. And so you ended up with places like this, the Salisbury. It's one of the original gin palaces. They were very grand, etched glass, as you can Clearly, see. I mean, the frontage is amazing. Yeah, it's it? stunning. It sort of laid the foundations for modern day pubs and restaurants. See, I love that. That's what this city has. You know what I mean? You can just kind of wander around and be interested. Yeah, exactly. London's recognised these days as being, you know, at the forefront of cocktail barting and everything, but there's mm -hmm. a massive history of drinking here as well. The places where I tend to drink is the old pubs, it's the old wine bars. You're getting an experience, and, and so much about what we're trying to do with cocktail culture is giving someone an experience. It's not just a nice drink. Totally agree. Baby, How you doing, guys? Hello, mate. Hey. How are you getting on? How's it going? Yeah, good, thank you. How are you? Really good, thank you. Kerry. Good. Lovely to meet you, Alex. Alex, nice good to meet you, brother. And we know each other very well. Yeah, too well, unfortunately. <laughs> so, Alex and I were on a flight over to the States once. We uh, got off at the wrong airport and had to do a road trip for through six Hang weeks. on, hang on. How do you get off at the wrong airport? Well, the plane was diverted because of the bad it's weather. Not a stop. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, logic escaped us from that day. <laughs> anyway, welcome, anyway, welcome to Dandelion. Yeah, welcome, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Tell me about the uh, the place. Yeah. So yeah, Dandelion's been open for about three and a half years. It is a hotel bar, but designed to be more of a neighbourhood service. And we operate uh, our drinks program under the strap line of modern botany, which sounds a little contrived, but it's actually it's just a nose to tail approach to plants. 
I knew Dandelion would be an ideal venue to produce something that represents where London is at uh, with cocktails right now, looking at things like um, sustainability. So what have you got in store for us? It's basically, it's what I've called a greener grass gimlet. Now, it's inspired by two things, reuse of ingredients and our cultural approach to, to eating and drinking. So we've become pretty great at finding what we're wasting and turning it into delicious stuff. We take all of our citrus peels that we normally trim down for garnish and we keep them to one side and turn them into an oleo. So that's instant free oleo, which is normally a complete pain to make and takes a bar back, you know, three hours to peel a case of lemons or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're also, I guess, accepting culturally some stranger ingredients. So the cordial's actually been acidified with wood ants. How do, how do they uh, arrive in the building? They do they walk in two by two, or is it like...? It's quite weird. It's like, it looks like a can of tuna, like it would be in anyone's house. You just yeah. pop it open, and you're like, oh. That's and it's, it's just ants. Just dried black ants. Now, that's not just there to be this gimmick ingredient. It's a conversation that that seems abnormal to us, but it's completely normal in other cultures. Mm -hmm. And London as a city is like a hot point for accepting these things and putting them out to the general public. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit funky, a little bit sort of umami flavors coming from that. What is a gimlet? Gimlet is essentially just spirit and cordial. Um, oh, OK. So super traditional. Normally it was gin and roses lime cordial. Um, which... It's an old naval drink. Back when sailors used to get scurvy, which is vitamin C so, deficiency, mm -hmm. they used to die from it. It was a major problem. The gimlet was invented by a surgeon who uh, administered it on board Navy ships, made using roses lime cordial, which of course is like a preservation of lime, mm -hmm. but still contains the ascorbic acid of vitamin C. And then they'd mix it with um, gin. Because they would, they would inevitably go in a drink, exactly. so you may yeah, as well yeah. They're sailors. Yeah. pair them off. Yeah. <laughs> so the drink itself, we're going to start with just a singular dash of absinthe. And we have 25 mils of this ant apple cordial. We're going to use Kettle One Vodka. Now, the wheat notes in this are going to go perfectly with the, the absinthe, and then it's going to provide body and length to the drink. One of the nice things about London is simple serves and elegant glassware. Beautiful glass. Yeah, I mean, I think this kind of serve is representative of where London's at at the moment. You look at it, and it's, it's elegant, it's beautiful, it's simple, but it's, there's no mm. crazy garnishing going on. But underneath all of that, there's all of this work that's gone in. Right. Wow, that is an interesting flavour. It's kind of, uh, I guess it's that you started with the absinthe. Yeah. There's, there's, there's that hint of licorice. Yeah. You know? It's just that kind of like fennel florality yes. that's like, that's, that's what it's about, you know? Mm. It is, it's the perfect start to this week in London. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Good to see you. Let's get a couple of uh, Johnny Walker highballs, please. Oh, that's nice and light. It's delicious, eh? Mm. I think a lot of people probably balk at the idea of putting brown spirits in a long, fizzy drink like that. But like long whiskey drinks, highball style drinks, I think are fantastic. Doing this trip that I've been doing, one thing I've been having a lot of is this whiskey highball. Mm. Is it coming into trend? Looking at whiskey as a whole and its versatility, um, it doesn't just belong in short, strong brown drinks. It's mixable. There's just so many riffs on a whiskey highball. I mean, you know, length and hour soda is one one way, and that you know, it's your classic whiskey and soda. But then the modifiers that can go in there, something aromatic, something floral, sweet, sour, whatever, mm -hmm. um, and you can end up with something truly delicious. Yeah, it's, it is delicious. Hi, mate. Hey. Oh. Come on, let's hug in. Yeah. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good, welcome to Black Rock. Thank you. It's great down here. Yeah, it's not really a kind of traditional whiskey bar look. The whole point of this bar is to kind of break down some of the barriers of entry to the whiskey category, and, and a lot of that is doing away with the traditional aspects of mm -hmm. like whiskey and, and shaking it up a little bit and trying to do something innovative and exciting. Well, look, have a seat and yeah. uh, we'll try some whiskey. All right, let's do it. I'll tell you what, mate, this is, uh, this is an impressive table. So this table um, is made from an oak tree trunk. Uh, English oak tree trunk, you know, 
pretty much every whiskey in this place has gone through an oak barrel. Um, and to have this massive chunk of oak sat in the middle of the bar, it becomes a talking point. Yeah. And I do love, I love the idea that there is just this big, old, beautiful piece of oak sitting here between us. There's going to be a whiskey sitting down on top of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Should I get you a whiskey? Yeah, I'd love one. Yeah? Yeah, I would. Yeah. So I'm going to give you some Talisker 10 to try. Now, it's a cult whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, like, a lot of people would place it in their top three distilleries in Scotland. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it has a great balance of different flavours. Um, there's smokiness in there, there's fruitiness, there's maltiness. There's a kind of maritime characteristic to it as well. So the trick when you're um, nosing any neat spirit, really, is just approach it from a distance. Have a little smell and see what aromas you can detect. Well, I'm, I'm immediately get that uh, um, the smokiness, it's yeah. the charcoal. It's but that smoke comes from the peat. Mm -hmm. uh, peat is a, a kind of fuel source that's dug up out of the ground, but it produces a lot of smoke. This is what would have been used to dry the barley that makes whiskey, and it's amazing because it kind of transcends time. Mm -hmm. um, this is a 10-year-old whiskey that we're smelling here, but the fire that dried that barley would have happened 10 or 11 years ago. It's quite incredible. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the most sort of prominent aromas on the nose when you, when you smell the whiskey. So let's have a taste. Just try a little bit in the mouth. I do suggest moving it around before swallowing, allowing it to coat your palate. And cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Wow, it really does give you a kick. It gets right in your nose and... Yeah, and that's where a lot of the magic happens. You're detecting it's, all those aromas. It's, it's quite incredible. That, that experience is, mm. is amazing. Yeah, it can feel like quite moving in a it way. It really is. Yeah. It really is. It's like, it's like spice. Mm. It's like heat coming from a food. You yeah. know how people thrive off that? Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. feeling. It's the same thing. And so this whiskey, um, Talisker, is from uh, the Isle of Skye, which is one of the larger islands in the Inner Hebrides. Off Sounds the, amazing. The coast. Yeah, I know, it does, right? <laughs> and a lot of people, um, when they taste Talisker, and, you know, I'm one of them, um, think that this is a whiskey that's really reminiscent of the ocean. There is a sort of saltiness to it. Definitely. You know, as much as any spirit, whiskey speaks of place. It speaks of location. That's why it's such a wonderful spirit to enjoy, because you're kind of t tasting the distilled essence of a location at mm -hmm. a certain time. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, we're going to forage, yeah? We are going to forage. There's a guy. He's called John. He's actually taken some of my bar team foraging before. Hi, guys. With a handful of greenery. How are you doing, John? Jerry. Nice to hey, meet John. you. How's Hi, it going? Chris. Yeah, good. John, Sounds... John the forager. Yeah, John the forager. Been foraging. Good man. Water... I wouldn't expect anything different. <laughs> Do you want to smell? It's water mint. Grows in the edge of the lake, has its feet in the water. Give it a crush. Oh. And a smell. It's lovely, isn't it? For me, this is like foraging wonderland. Mm. And I notice things all over the place. So this, this is pineapple weed. I said pineapple weed. So this is related yeah. to chamomile. You had no I idea. <laughs> this is like, just squish a bit in your fingers and smell it. Just the flower bud. Oh, wow. I mean, That's it looks so like a little pineapple. It smells like pineapple. Mm. It tastes like pineapple. And it's called pineapple weed. This you could eat, if you like, but it won't do you any good at all. It's extraordinarily poisonous. Is that water hemlock? This is hemlock. Hemlock. You shouldn't arbitrarily nibble anything. You wanted to look at oxide daisies, didn't you? Yeah. Um, well, they're all around you. Have a flower. Give it a bite. Thank you. You can, you can eat the whole thing. Yeah, but give it a little nibble. Give it a bite. See if you like it. So I think it's got an all sort of kind of artificial sweetness to it. it tastes a bit kind of like bubblegum. It does a little bit. It tastes a little bit like a flower as well. What are you thinking? I, this is just. This is amazing. I'm just walking Good. through the park eating Good flowers. Good news. So over here we have got elderflower. 
So that's a spray of elderflower. Give it a smell. For me, elderflower is like the flavour of British summer. Yeah. Up here as well, you've yeah. got lime. So this is a linden or a lime tree. Have a little munch on that and see what you think. Thank you. It's so sweet. Isn't it? That is like honey. Yeah, I think it tastes exactly like honeydew melon. Some more of that. So what are you going to do with all this stuff then? So much stuff we've got is going to pair really well with gin because gin's got that botanical characteristic already. Mm. Everything we've got is delicious. Yeah. And so I can't see anything other than a delicious drink coming out. Ah, uh, I'm about to boogie, got my groove on. Fleeks up, trying to get my cue on. Only main people in my circle, everybody else is getting cut like coupons. And from a flavour perspective, there's a whole kind of larder of ingredients there to access. But all you need to do is just take one second and yeah, just look down. Yeah, that moment. Very rewarding, yeah. Yeah, it really was. It really was. You doing some flower arrangement? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking out the spoils of today. We did well. This food was oh, great. Amazing stuff. Are you going to start eating those? Because I want to make some drinks. You've got glasses over I there. Glasses ice over here. glasses, please, Kerry. Plenty of ice, mate. OK. The more ice, the better. Why? There's a kind of common misconception that you put more ice in a glass and you get a more dilute drink or you get less drink or something along those lines. But actually, more ice makes your drink colder, keeps it colder longer, and it also stops the drink from diluting. Thanks, mate. I'll put 50 ml of Tanqueray number 10. These glasses are nice. So, yeah, these are Copa glasses. They are very popular in Spain, where uh, gin and, the gin and tonic is very popular. Yeah. And they're actually great. Um, first of all, because, as you quite rightly notice, you can get a lot of ice in there. Do you have your specific times that you make a, a drink like this, a gin and tonic? Yeah, 100%. I think that's one of the great things about cocktails is that they all fit into different occasions and different moments. It's fantastic in the afternoon. It's fantastic when the sun's shining. Um, it's a wonderful pre-dinner drink because it fits all the criteria of the perfect aperitif. It's slightly bitter and it's fizzy, so it really gets the palate going and prepares you for food. Right, let's um, stick some grapefruit wedges uh, in these two. Okay. Juniper is obviously the dominant flavour of gin normally, and that's, that's what you expect to find. But Tanqueray number 10, much more citrus driven, um, and so it works really well with this grapefruit garnish. Gives it that little bit of bitterness that combines nicely with a tonic, too. That's uh, pretty impressive, just what that one wedge has just done to that drink. Yeah. In terms of how good it looks. Oh, the colour contrast, right? Because it, it's so vibrant with the pink grapefruit, isn't it? It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah it looks beautiful. There's a little swell like that. All right. And then um, these guys are getting thirsty. There so. you go. Oh, thank Your you. One. <laughs> and then. What I'm thinking is, let's garnish these two with some of our yes. wonderful... What was the one we loved? It was this... Yeah, the oh, elderflower. elderflower. Yeah, elderflower yeah, that was be beautiful, good. isn't it? So what you could do is kind of pop that in the middle of the glass, and it's... Oh, I mean, yeah. that almost looks like a, a kind of vase come gin and tonic. And then, remember these? The uh, pineapple weed. Mm -hmm. I'm actually particularly excited about these because John told us these are related to chamomile. Uh -huh. Chamomile is used to make this gin. And actually, if you smell it now, I actually get a bit of chamomile aroma off it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Oh, it does. Mm. Let's pop that one in there. Beautiful. And this elderflower just smells amazing. Just explodes. It's a light drink. It tastes refreshing. And that's why the fizz is there as well, because that helps sort of brighten it, freshen it up, get it lively. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Kerry. Pippa, nice, nice to meet you. Hi, Pippa, how are you doing? Very well, how are you? Good to see you. You've properly left the best to last. Yeah, I like certified. This is the best bar in the world. What's your go to here? Like when I come to the American bar, I often drink classic cocktails because it's an old bar, but 
what is incredible about this place is that they're still producing like really great menus with delicious, new, innovative drinks. We want to remain true to the sort of classic cocktail culture um, without becoming a cocktail museum. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important that we keep sort of innovating and moving and with the times as well because people are doing some like amazingly creative, awesome stuff at the moment. So it's important that we keep a balance between the two. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do one martini. You can't come to the Savoy and leave without having a martini. Yeah, um, I like that So we're going to make like a martini for you. Um, yeah. And then a green park as well. The martini is, for many people, um, the definitive cocktail. Mm -hmm. And so to drink that in the American bar at the Savoy, uh, it's probably right up there at the top of the list of, of things to do in the world of cocktails. I, I feel like hotel bars are quite prevalent here in, in the UK. Yeah, I mean, there's a historical precedent for it. During Prohibition, when all the bars in America closed down, of course, there was an exodus of, of quality bartenders from America. And that was when a lot of the, the famous hotel bars in Europe became established. Um, yeah, sure. Because a lot of American travelers still wanted to be drinking cocktails when they were abroad. You know, an American bar was kind of a catch-all term for a cocktail bar. So, dry martini for you. Yeah, this is a big moment. Sitting in the world's best bar drinking a martini. It's pretty special. It's perfect. It's, it's perfect. Oh. It's perfect. <laughs> it's just perfect. It just has that crispness to it. Mm. Delicious. One thing that has been absolute theme of this week, there's a story behind every drink. You're almost tasting the time and the place where that drink was invented. You know, this spirit was popular and it was in this place. And it is like a form of kind of time travel. And that's what's so amazing about it. This is the Green Park, created here by Eric Lentz. It's like a gin sour with fresh basil and celery bitters. Okay. That's the best way I can describe it to you. This is the modern and the historical, yeah. one of each. That's really good. Isn't it? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Green Park's a good name for it. That is delicious. Wow, that basil explodes. It's beautiful. When we finish, I, I do genuinely get quite emotional that the week's over. Like, I, you know, I meet these amazing people and I get made these incredible drinks and I don't think moments like this could happen without these drinks sitting in front of us. Like, it's such an amazing talking point, such an amazing experience to share. I'm at the best bar in the world. We're finishing on a high here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. Cheers. Cheers, brother. Cheers, Pip. Thank Cheers. you. Thank Enjoy. you. Enjoy. <laughs>